Today, I'm going to start somewhere between a four and seven week conversation with you guys. Uh, it hadn't quite worked itself out. I haven't quite figured out all of it, but it's at least four weeks, potentially seven weeks. Um, that means I'll have spoken nine weeks in a row, which is, by the grace of God, probably the longest that I've ever done since I've been the pastor of the church. But he's got it, not me, so I'm not doing it in my power. I'm doing it in his. I'm going to get a little bit of that. What, what do you call it, Drew? The a HSP? The Holy Spirit power? Um, and I'm going to let him, him run the show, okay? So today, uh, I want to talk about church. Start a conversation about church. I love church. I love our church. Do you guys love our church? Do you love the church, the big church, right? Um, and I don't know what comes to your mind or what you think about or what you feel when you hear that word church. Some of you have bad church experiences. I have bad church experiences. Um, but chances are it's a far cry from what the people of the first century thought of or experienced when they heard the word church, right? Nobody was bored in the first century when it came to church because they didn't think of buildings. They didn't think of rows. They didn't think of pews. They didn't think of robes, hymnals, bands. They didn't think of Bible apps. In fact, they didn't even really have a Bible. They were writing it at the time. They didn't know. They had the Old Testament. I don't want to take that away from them. They did have the, the Law and the Prophets. But most of the New Testament hadn't even been written yet when the church was launched. They didn't have bands. They didn't have banners. The church was simply a gathering of people who came together around one belief. And that belief was that Jesus Christ was the risen Christ, that he was the son of the living God. That was all they had. And that was more than enough to launch this movement that God came to do. And it was big. When the doors opened on opening day, it was big. Now, in order to understand what we're going to get into for the next couple of weeks, we have to start off with, what is the Greek word for church? And it is simply this word. It's the Greek word in the New Testament for church is ekklesia, which is simply an assembly or a gathering. But the English term church, when it was originally translated, came from an entire different Greek term, which meant of the Lord. And it was picked up and adopted by a group of people called the Goths. Not to be confused with the Gothics, but the Goths. It was a, a, a sect of Christianity back in the East Germanic tribe. Um, so I got two beautiful, lovely German people here that can help me with this next word, okay? Around 300 AD, they used this word. There you go, Kirsha. <laughs> <laughs> Which translates to Lord's house. Right? So it was a bad translation of the word from Greek. It was, the, the Greek word was assembly or gathering. They used this Kersha word, which meant Lord's house. And this really is a bad translation because at the end of the day, what ends up happening? And it caused a whole bunch of bad theology because all of a sudden, church became a place rather than a movement or a gathering of people. It all of a sudden became, and this is really going to, some of your theology might get wrecked here, it became tame. It became localized to a place controlled by people and controlled by the building they were in. But in the 16th century, in the 16th century, there was a man by the name of William Tyndale that did something super amazing and super bold. This is William. How you doing, William? He's been gone for a few years. We miss you. Um, uh, but in the 16th century, William uh, was referred to as the father of the English Bible. Okay, Because what William did was he translated and published the Bible in English from the original text in the Hebrew. Okay? Word for word. And this was scandalous. Because guess what it did? It took the power away from the church. He once said to a bishop at the Church of England, of the Church of England, he said this to one of the Catholic bishops of the Church of England, who wanted to keep the scriptures out of the hands of common people. This is what he told him. If God spared my life, 
ere many years, I, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to know more of the scripture than you do. And in 1524, he fled from England to Germany, where his first version of the New Testament was published. And then it was smuggled into England. Tyndale continued translating the Bible until a friend of his betrayed him. And he was hung and burned at the stake in 1536. And one of the things that drove the church leaders crazy in his day was the translating of this word, ecclesia, as congregation, rather than kershe or house of the Lord. Because it took the power out of their hands. Moving the focus from a building led by people to the people that are gathering in groups. Now, in Matthew 16, we find the first reference to what the church is in the New Testament. And Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? What's the word on the street? What's the, what's the download? What's, what, what's the info they got on me? What's the wiki page say about me, okay? Someone said he was the, re, some say that he was the reincarnated of John the Baptist or Elisha. He came and got his cup at Passover. That was a little throwback to what we did a couple weeks ago, y'all. Come on, right? But then he turned around and he looked at his 12 and he goes, okay, okay, okay. Who do you say that I am? And who spoke up? None other than our buddy Peter. And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, Son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I will tell you, Peter, on this rock, on this declaration, I will build my ecclesia. I will build my gathering. I will build my, my grouping assembly of people. And the gates of death will not overcome it. And then a couple months, a couple weeks later, Jesus is beaten, mocked, and nailed to a cross. He's placed in a tomb, and then Jesus rises from the dead and punctuates everything that he was telling them. Launches the new covenant that Jeremiah talks about when he said it's written on their, it's in their heads, it's on their hearts. And then two months after the resurrection, his Ecclesia would officially be launched. And Luke, who thoroughly investigated all things Jesus and wrote this beautiful account of the life of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, writes to Theophilus, the same guy he, he studied all things Jesus for, he said he, he studied the entire launching of the first 40 years of the church and he wrote the book of Acts. Jesus spent 40 days with his followers and he told them, not to go public until what? Until they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Until the, the Holy Spirit shows up that God fills them. And in Acts chapter, uh, chapter 1, right in the beginning, verses 6 and 8. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They didn't know much about the church. They were waiting for the new Jewish kingdom to come. Jesus as king, reigning conqueror to come in and take over. They still had this, it's all about us mentality. When are we going to get to rule on high? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times and the dates of the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes. And they're like, yes, power. We want that. Bring that on. Come on. Where's that at? And he said to them, 
And you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now the word here, witness, um, is martos, mar mar martus, and it simply means <clears throat> one who testifies to or affirms something. So that's what Jesus is calling them. You're going to testify to something. You're going to affirm something. Or otherwise, you're going to testify or proclaim me, your risen Lord. You who witnessed me die on a cross, learned from me for three and a half years, witnessed me die, and then now you're experiencing me alive again. Right, Thomas? You just put your hand and your finger through the hole in my hands. And the piercing in my side, Thomas, you're going to go witness to the world about who I am. You're going to teach them what I've taught you, and you're going to baptize them in my name. And they must have thought, us? Like us. We're 12 ragtags, 11 now, unfortunately, right? Because Judas made his bed. Us? To the ends of the earth? I can't even get out of Jerusalem. Ends of the earth? How are we even going to get there? I mean, come on. Jesus had a handful plus Mary and a couple other. Like, and those people, they went back to Jerusalem. And they did what Jesus said. They waited for two weeks. And Luke, again, who thoroughly investigated all things, tells us that it was when the apostles, in some word, including Mary, and he even says the brothers of Jesus. So guess who was there? James, who didn't believe his brother was who he said he was. And then he experienced his resurrected brother was like, oh, I was wrong. And on the day of Pentecost, a Jewish feast, again, it's another festival that they had, when the city would be full of Jews, and converts to Judaism from all around the world, the Holy Spirit fell on men and women in that room. You want the evidence? What was the evidence? They could speak in the language of Jews. Not from Jerusalem, but from all over the world. You need more? Luke list 14 14 different groups that heard their own language. This was not a Jewish movement or a message. Jesus was right. It was something for the entire world. It was the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. I'm going to do something through you for the world. Not just for Israel, not just for my, my people, but I'm going to do something in your family for the entire world. And I can't imagine how easy this first thing must have happened. Peter stood up and he preaches the first ever sermon in the church history. And it couldn't have been too hard because when they were filled, they were testifying and speaking in other languages of the goodness of God and all that God had done. So Peter had the easy job. He just stands up and he proclaims it. And he stands up and he says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Pay attention to me. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourself know, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate pan, plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. We learned from him. You arrested him, you beat him, you mocked him, you nailed him to a cross. That's on you. But God has raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was, an imp it was impossible for death to keep a hold on him. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witness of it. I was there, Peter would say. I denied even knowing him. He is exalted to the right hand of God and has received the Father, the, 
from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, which has been poured out on you. Now see and hear. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brother, what must we do? What shall we do? And, G and Peter said, Attend church regularly. Church? What's church, Peter? No, 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 no. He said, he said, hey, make sure you don't miss mass. Mass? Like, isn't that something that weighs something? Mass? No, he said this. Peter said, replied, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin, on him for you. It's on him, it was for you. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Promise, the promise is for you and your children and all of them for, are far off for all whom the Lord will give, uh, the, the God will crawl. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, we warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, <laughs> and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Day one, church went from zero, maybe 20, 25, maybe 75 like us, to 3,000 on day one. 3,000 people from 14 different language groups believed. They, they heard something, and they believed. And sometimes people say, John, I don't really like big church. Well, you wouldn't have liked opening day. <laughs> and, you, and let's be real. You might not enjoy heaven if you don't like big groups of people that believe in Jesus. There's going to be a party and I promise you, there's going to be more than 3,000. But just as Jesus had predicted, it was a gathering that rallied around one idea that Jesus Christ was, he is the resurrected Christ. He is the son of the living God who came to take away the sins of the world. You killed him, God raised him, we've seen him, say you're sorry. You couldn't go to church because you know why? You were the church. The church wasn't for the people. There weren't any church people yet. The church wasn't about a location. They didn't have one. The church wasn't about a style or a, a, literary, a liturgy or, or rituals. There were none. The mission of the church was to do one thing, create people who believed and loved Jesus and became followers of what Jesus taught them to do, which was what? Love people. Love as I have loved. That was it. You want to follow what Jesus did? Love the way Jesus did. Well, what did Jesus do? He died for you. So that the wages of sin was paid for and you had nothing else. Like, you are free to love God and be in relationship with God, in community with God. And from that day forward, there's always been a group of people that refuse to let go of this idea of the ecclesia. They refuse to make it about a building and pretty lights and bands. People like missionaries. People like church planters, evangelists, Bible translators, pastors, student pastors, Bible smugglers. 
teachers, men and women like William Tyndale, who defied the church leaders when they sought to make it something completely different than what God wanted it to be. People like some of you here who give of your time to serve the body, that give of your time to invite people to experience something different, that give of your time to cheer when somebody decides to make a public profession of their faith and get baptized. Like some of, someone who accepts Jesus as their Lord and then begins the, the starting lines there. That's the, that's the starting line. And then they go through the process of giving up things, giving up things, letting God become Lord of all things in their life. When someone else gets to another letter of, level of surrender and there's people to rally around them and cheer them on. People who realize that when you gather in your homes and office, you are the church. Thank you, Bob and Jill, for opening your doors and allowing people to come in and have dinner at your house. You are the church. Thank you, Liz and Clay, for opening up Publix to become the church. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who has their doors open and allows people to come in there. You are the church. People who realize that when you serve the poor, you are the church. Bob, your heart for those people that have less blows me away. Thank you, my friend. You are the church. When you pray for the sick, when you live out the values that Jesus taught us, you are the church. When you feel like an outcast, outcast, in your fraternity, in your sorority, in your office, at your home, because you believe something, you are the church. It's why we continue to create more gathering places for you guys to meet. Small groups, serve teams, events like the Passover Seder. Because we agree with Peter that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And church doesn't happen on Sunday morning in these four walls. I don't know what comes to mind or what you feel when you hear the word church. But from now on, I hope you will think and you will feel of a multiplying, multicultural gathering of people who believe that Jesus is the Savior and whose lives continuously to grow into a more reflection of who Jesus Christ is through his teachings. The church began as a movement and it's still moving. And by God's grace, we will be part of that movement. And we are part of that movement. And the church for your generation and for my generation, the church for Pasco County, the church for Odessa, for Lutz, for, New Tampa, for North Tampa, we are going to continue serving God and serving people, loving as I have loved, helping people take the next step into sanctification by getting out of these four walls and getting out there where the people are, where the sick are, where the lost are, where the lonely are. And being in relationship, like Jesus was, they didn't, Jesus wasn't their Messiah when they first became followers of Jesus. Jesus said, follow me, and then I will make you believers by what you see. If you don't believe in me, look at the evidence, is what one of the Gospels tells us. You want the evidence? I rose from the dead. Anybody else? Okay, Lazarus, but I helped you. Okay, you know, it's like, We're going to continue this conversation that we're next week. This is just week one, y'all. But y'all have to understand, the church isn't this, in this room. This is part of the church. It tells us not to forsake the assembly of saints. So we're not forsaking the assembly of saints. But the church happens when you walk out that door and you go to lunch. You want to know why we invite you guys to take somebody to lunch? Because that's where the church happens. That's where relationships happen. 
That's where life happens. When I show up at Drew and Shana's house and they're like, you again? They don't ever say that, by the way. Uh, um, Drew calls it his, his, his shepherd time. Um, I think it's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> but that's the church. We're going to continue this conversation next week. I'm going to close this out in prayer. Brent, you and your team can come up here. So, Father, we just thank you for the fact that you did not call us to be a building. You didn't call us to be a place that was stationary and did not move. You called us to be the hands and feet of Christ. So you've asked us to be your gathering, your assembly of saints. Your word tells us that where two or more are gathered, you are in their midst. Doesn't matter if it's a Publix Greenwise coffee shop. Doesn't matter if it's around the dinner table at Bob and Jill's or around the dinner table at my house or around the prayer group at Pam's house on Friday mornings. It doesn't matter. Where two or more are gathered, you are in their midst. They are the church. And Jesus, we need you to change the mentality, change the realization of what we have as the church. That we become more community mindset, more people mindset, more get out of these four walls mindset. So that people can see your reflection in us. And as relationships are born, uh, are born out of that, and as relationships are deepened out of that, that the sanctification process, because we apply what James, your brother Jesus said, that confess your sins to one another that they might be healing, because the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. You want to know why I get over some of the stuff that I do? Because I confess it to two guys in this church and they pray for me. I take the dark things into the light. I talk to my wife when I'm having issues, and, I, and the dark things go into the light, and there's prayer, and there's healing that comes from it. That's the church, y'all. And Jesus, we need you to do a new thing at New Day. Give us a new identity of what the church looks like, what, what we're supposed to do as the church. Give us a new purpose as New Day Church to go out and be the hands and feet of Christ. The way that you've called New Day Church to do it, not the way that we thought it was supposed to be. Because our, our understanding of the church is so twisted sometimes because of things that we've learned. It took me a long time to understand the church wasn't this building. Church is when I show up at Brent's house, when I show up at Drew's house, and I grab a hammer and I say, what we're working on? What are we breaking? Because that's what I'm good for, breaking things. But I'm really good at building relationships and being in relationships. I didn't used to be, but I'm getting better. So, Father, right now, I just speak, Holy Spirit, convict the minds that are still twisted with the mentality of what church is. And tie them into a community, into a place, whether it's Jill and uh, uh, Bob and Jill's house for Friday night dinners, whether it's with Liz and the women at, on, at Greenwise or Clay and the guys or the couples at Greenwise, whatever it is, whether it's the prayer team, whether it's love and respect, whether it's anxious for nothing, there's a few options, guys. Because we want to be your church, Jesus. We want to get back to where we don't need a building to be the church. Because what happens if we don't have a building? Are we still the church? We can still do community, right? I'll meet you all in a parking lot. I don't need a microphone. Y'all know that. <laughs> that's truth. I don't care what y'all say. That's, that's just truth. So once again, Holy Spirit, you do your job. Convict us, change our mind, lead us to repentance about what we're doing wrong as the church. And we ask all these things in the most powerful name of Jesus, the one who rose from the grave, conquered death, hell, and the grave.